Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Today, we're interviewing Neil McDonald, the CEO of the AMP Financial Planning Association. As I'm sure everyone is aware, with the stroke of a pen about a month ago, a thousand AMP practices were almost halved in value, but overnight, which is crazy, right? Like this, this sort of cornerstone of the entire financial services industry has uh, really done one of the biggest mm, results from the Royal Commission. And it's affecting many, many advisors. Uh, So we sort of dive into how we got here, what's the results, what's going to happen now, what advisors are doing to sort of, uh, you know, combat the changes. But also, like, on a higher level, what does that mean for the industry? Where are we heading to in the future? Uh, All those good kind of questions. So hopefully you enjoy. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop, easy-to-use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net or visit financialexpress.net for more information. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from XY Advisor. And today we have a really cool conversation with Neil McDonald from the AMP Financial Planning Association. G'day, Neil. Hi, Clayton. How are you going? Mate, good. Well, Probably better than you, at least recently. So uh, for anyone that doesn't know, and I couldn't imagine a single advisor in Australia not knowing this already, but there's, there's, been, some, uh, there's been some movement at the station in regards to yeah. uh, AMP planners and AMP in general with what they want to achieve as a business direction moving forward. And it seems to be, at least from where I'm sitting, that the thing that's getting pushed to the chopping block first is advisors. Now, as the head of the AMP Financial Planning Association, um, mate, you have been well and truly on the front lines of this, let's call it conversation, let's maybe call it a battle, depending on the, the language you want to use. But um, it's, it's something that's affecting well, the biggest licensee in, in Australia. And you're sort of front and center as a part of the, you know, organizing what the response is from advisors. So, uh, mate, tell us where, do you, where does this begin? Like how do you even attempt to, you know, respond to such a huge company like AMP? Look, I guess to start with, up to now, we've always had um, discussions with them, negotiations with them, and so on. Those discussions and negotiations typically take six months to 18 months for something like as big as a bowler change. Um, this time around, we basically got informed there's going to be some changes. Only half the board was told. It was under a non-disclosure agreement, so we couldn't actually even speak to the rest of the board. And then the announcement was made. So for the first time in you know, probably 160 years, uh, a change was made without any consultation or negotiation. Um, and more importantly, without any notice being given to the advisors. So they couldn't actually decide whether they were going to accept the changes or just be given them on without notice, basically. So it's quite shocking for everybody, whether they were planning to stay, whether you're planning to go, or whether you hadn't made your mind up. Um, and even the firms who are staying now are getting twitchy because effectively AMP says the contract's worthless and you can change it whenever you feel like it. So, yeah. So, I, I guess in a practical sense, what does that mean for us? Well, we're paid by the members. We're a non profit, we're a member based association, and they asked us to help. Um, in a practical sense, we coordinate the actions. So, 
whatever happens will be, you know, the planner is actually taking the action, not us, but we've been looking at, you know, the legal firms that might be able to help them. We've been going through a bit of a sort of a review of who's available. Um, and we're pretty close to making some announcements about that. In fact, it might even be this week. So. Right. Now, so I'm not fully familiar with the legalities. So maybe you can let me know if I'm right or if I'm wrong. But essentially, AMP had a clause in their contract with all their planners, well, I should say with all of their uh, practices that said, a change to the sale terms um, would be given 13 months notice before, or I guess everyone would have 13 months to make a decision on whether they wanted to stay or go um, for any future change. And that was always seen as somewhat of an insurance for the practice owners so that you know, if anything like this turned up, they would always have ample warning to actually sort of stay or go or make a decision before being directly affected. But in this case, um, the, the consultants, I believe came to AMP and they said, look, don't live up to that part of the contract, uh, break that part of the contract. Um, now just tell everyone what the changes are. Um, give them some really sort of strict terms, put them under an NDA um, and, and then sort of just sit back and wait. Now, the advisors have responded to this and said, well, what about the 13-month clause? And I, I, at a really simple level, how can a company just break a contract like that. So I'm just super confused that how this could even happen, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, look, I think there's probably two parts to it. There is a clause that says if there's a detrimental impact for the planners, they have to give 13 months notice. And that, you know, changing the bowler from four times to two and a half maximum and, you know, 1.42 times glide path we think is detrimental to the planners. Um, AMP is arguing that clause doesn't apply, that it is actually about, there's an economics clause that they're saying that they can use, but to use the economics clause, two things. One, they've got to consult with us, and they haven't, obviously. And the second thing is we think the economics have been caused by them. So we don't think it's valid anyway. Yeah. Um, and the third thing is it's never been tied to the market at all. I mean, as... as you know probably that it's been, you know, cornerstone of their value proposition to attract planners in the first place, to fund them to grow their businesses and to give them certainty about their exit. Um, so we think it does, it's a bit like having a McDonald's franchise. That burger shop costs a lot more than the local burger shop. So, you know, we think it's been a closed ecosystem. That, that They've never changed the multiple... Um, you know, through a global financial crisis, through two world wars, through a stock market crash, but suddenly they have to change it now. So it doesn't seem fair. Yeah. And so, that, that's the basis, you know, the action that our members will be taking. So I guess from their point of view, they're saying, well, we actually do have a clause that we can lean on. Is that the centerpiece of their argument? Yeah, but they can only lean on it if there's been an economic change and secondly, if they've consulted. Right. And we okay. don't think they can lean on it anyway because there's a detrimental change which we've got to give 13 months notice for. Yeah, right. And so AMP have chosen to take this path and, and obviously that's, that's no secret. It's very much public knowledge. Um, obviously, I've never read a single one of these contracts because all advisors are under NDAs. And so I don't really know much about it other than what I've read in, um, in the, I think trade media, one of them put out a, an article or on, on what's being offered. Um, but it does, it does seem like that there is a, a, a large disadvantage to accepting the terms and then an even larger disadvantage for not accepting the terms. And, um, and I'm just thinking, like, what else do you do? So the, the AMP, FPA, 
uh, are, are putting forward a solution um, where it's a class action. So that is, that's one strategy and it is sort of uh, full force, you know, front on, uh, you know, bashing against uh, the other, I guess you could say, much larger, larger corporation. So fighting fire with fire. I have heard of other strategies. Um, I believe someone was telling me about how because AMP Bank owned the loan and then AMP uh, uh, FP own the business, that there is a way to um, lose the loan by claiming some weird kind of bankruptcy um, and then, but you don't lose the asset. Again, I've never done it. I'm not really clear. Has that strategy been put forward to you at all or, or does that ring a bell no, with any, anything that you've heard in the market? It sounds a bit weird to me, that strategy, to be honest. <laughs> um, but the, the reality is um, AMP FB actually owns the register of clients. So yeah. our members have basically the right to look after the register, to grow the register and sell it back to AMP. The bank lends them the money and the bank has always lent the money based on the bowler value at the time. And so practice startup offers used to get 100% lent and most firms get 80% lent. So the loan to valuation ratios. There is an indemnity from AMP group to AMP bank. So in the event there's a shortfall, um, the bank gets paid out by AMP. And so that may be where whoever was speaking to you was saying there's a get out clause. But the reality is if you're you know, a 30 odd year old advisor, you don't want to be insolvent and go into liquidation to get out paying a debt that you thought was going to be paid anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, the challenge we've got is we've got different sorts of clients, if you like, our members. So the first group of members are those who put their notice in, you know, last year sometime, gave 12 months notice, and suddenly has the, you know, the, the bowler terms changed midstream. And, and these are, you know, one guy's 70 odd years old, there's a lot in their 60s, late 60s, you know, they're planning to retire, and suddenly they've gone from a bowler value of maybe $2 million to 800 grand, or, or bigger numbers in some cases. Um, the second group are people who are planning to stay. And the problem for them is they've been encouraged to borrow money. Like one guy borrowed $5 million as recently as July 2017. And suddenly his bowler value and the lending, he's going to have to figure out how he gets you know, cash flow is the first thing. And then secondly, where is he going to be able to repay the loan from? And then the third group are those who... You know, basically, AMP's just tapped on the shoulder and said, we don't like you anymore, please leave. And again, there's probably about, you know, 150, 180 firms who were planning to be at AMP for some time. And suddenly, because of a change in strategy, they're being told they can leave. In some cases, um, the restraints are being eased, but in others, it's just a case of, you know, here's your 90 days notice. Um, you've got a three-year restraint from working in the industry which is a pretty tough restraint. <laughs> you know, you can even be a cleaner and you're an XY advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so would you say in your professional experience, because obviously, uh, you know, you've, you've been in this industry f for a while, would you say that this is a worst case scenario? Look, I actually think it's, it's unprecedented and I think there have been better ways of dealing with it. You know, I think in a practical sense, if they'd have said, you know, the people have already put their notice in, we're going to pay them out because that's the honourable thing to do. If they'd have said to the guys that were staying, look, you know, uh, we want you to stay, we're going to actually refinance, organise that, you know, give some certainty. And for the group they wanted to get rid of, if they'd basically said to most of them, look, we don't see you fitting in here, um, what we're going to do is remove the restraints and let you go work for somebody else. And, you know, if you've got negative equity and you borrowed more than your, your value, we'll, we'll clear it. I think that would have been a sort of fairly, wouldn't be ideal, but it'd be a reasonable outcome. 
yeah. and I think it would have meant that you know the, the trust would have continued because the, the, what they've done is actually impacted on trust on a company that's been there for 170 years you know? yeah yeah it's um I mean I, I a part of me looks at it if I if I really strip all emotion out and I go okay this this new team's been brought in to sort of rescue AMP and you know they they've brought in consultants just to figure out the best way for them to to get out of the bind that they're in um and so I I understand from like a ruthless point of view what they're trying to achieve but I think they you know sitting here um I, I just feel like their chances of succeeding are probably diminished because they've given a lot of people no way out. And if, if your back is up against the wall, I mean, you kind of, you're forced into action. And I think what you just mentioned there, if they'd been more reasonable, then there's a good chance that, with you know with with maybe a small amount of kickback but because these are quite uh unattractive terms from my limited understanding of them yeah it, it's going to kick up uh a huge a huge you know a huge mess and so what i'm guessing is that because of the lack of trust um that advisors who would even be interested in staying. Um, so across the board, so obviously there's advisors that they want to get rid of, but because of the way that these other advisors have been treated, even if you're not being kicked out, so to speak, you're, you're probably thinking you're on very, very shaky ground. And then it kind of makes sense um, to partner with the other advisors that are in the bad position to ensure that well at least you're protected in a group kind of um you know if if they all work together then there's probably that's the best chance of fighting against it now i've got no doubt that this is going to be a mammoth like legal case um i i would say you know because we know each other beyond this podcast that at least AMP planners can, you know, be thankful for someone with your experience is in this position that you are in. Um, but this is going to take, I would imagine years, right? Like this isn't going to be a, a really quick um, legal case, is it? No, no legal cases are quick. Um, I mean, the good thing is we're down to the, two legal firms. We've spoken to, you know, a number of litigation funders. Um, they all think we've got a very good case, which is nice. It means that, you know, the case will be fully funded. So planners won't have to put their hands in their pockets, um, wow. which means that it's really about the time it takes rather than the cost it takes. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing is that individual planners may have uh, cases they can take themselves as well, you know, whether it's for, you know, misleading and deceptive conduct or whether it's uh, unconscionable conduct. Um, but as you've said, the, the best course of action we think for our members, and it's up to them to decide, is to go with a sort of group action. Um, I think there is safety in numbers and, and, you know, it's impacted everybody. I mean, whether you're staying or going, the fact that AMP's removed the 13 months notice is, is a big change. I mean, we've had Hillwoss and Charter guys um, coming to us and saying they're happy to fund the action because they know that if it gets changed for the FP guys, it's only a matter of time before it gets changed for Hillwoss. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how does what you're doing... Um, I believe that the AIOFP are asking advisors to sort of dip into a fund to do something. Is is that a, is that associated at all with what you guys are doing? The, the AIOFP through their um, separate organisation they've set up is taking a 
a constitutional challenge to remove grandfathered commissions and saying the government can't do that. Right. Um, so they've been asking for people to chip in 300 bucks and um, you know, support their action. Right. Um, and, and, and we're sort of broadly supportive of that because um, we don't think it's fair that people get sort of carpet pulled away from underneath them. From our, from our perspective, though, we, we basically said we think grandfathering should go and, and, and what we've been asking for is a reasonable period of time. It's a yes. bit like, um, you know, we've basically said that there are a number of things that need to be addressed, such as, you know, um, basically capital gains tax impacts, you know, the insurability issue for some people that they can't move, some of the products don't allow you to charge a fee, Centrelink issues. Um, and, and subject to them being addressed, then a reasonable transition, we said, was probably two or three years. Um, and so, because effectively, most planners are fairly resilient. You know, if you say to them, you can't do this, yeah. and you give them a bit of time, they'll, they'll go back to the clients they need to go back to and change them to fees, right? Yes. So I, so I guess that the AIOFP is, um, is really just a general in nature grandfathering issue whereas the AMP FPA you guys are dealing specifically with uh, AMP planners that that certainly makes sense um, what what kind of what kind of advisors are not getting involved like why would you not get involved with this class action like have, have you heard any argument in the market that says there's a reason why i'm not going to join the class action because of xyz because i guess where i want to end up with is how do people how do amp advisors get involved in this but before i ask you that question it's like why wouldn't they uh, look, th th there's basically two sorts of class actions. There's open class actions and closed ones. Um, so it, it, depending on which way the lawyers go, um, if it's an open class action, you define what the class of people is and everybody's in invited, well, everybody's involved unless they specifically opt out. Uh, for closed action, somebody may decide not to be involved because, you know, they want to stay in P, um, Changes in contracts without notice are important. And, and so even the firms that are staying have said to us they're keen for us to, to push this. And obviously for firms who are going, the difference between four times and maybe you know 1.42 or uh, two and a half times is a significant amount of money. So, oh, yeah. You know, I think there will be some people who might opt out, but the vast majority I think will just opt in. We did a survey of our members, more than 90% respond and more than 3% want to take legal action. Yeah, wow. So big numbers. Um, well, that's really good. Like what, what are the, let's say I'm an AMP planner, let's say um, I want to stay. What, is there, is, there a, um, is there a reason why I couldn't, stay with my licensee while at the same time I'm a part of a class action against them? Or is there, I mean, is there a legal reason why I can't do that? Or is there a professional sort of courtesy why I wouldn't do that? Or is, is there any, could I get bullied out of the licensee if I'm seen to be supporting him? Like what are the genuine risks of supporting being a part of a class action with, with an AMP planner that wants to stay in AMP? As I said, if it's a open class action, they won't even know if you're involved or not because everybody would be involved automatically. Right. Um, the, the second thing is um, the court actually stops somebody like an A&B forcing people out of actions because that would be unconscionable conduct. Right. So, you know, th th there's a number of reasons why um, neither A&B nor the planner would be wanting to sort of, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, they wouldn't want to be seen to be opposing an action, which was a fair action. Okay. That's, that's really good intel. So um, if it's an open, all planners will just become a part of it. What do they need to do if it ends up being a closed action? 
pay or the legal firm would actually say this action is is available and would you be in you know, like to join yeah okay so it's relatively simple then yeah it, it's, it's basically normally an application form and you fill it in and send it and, and you're, you're in yeah, if, right. it's a, as I said, if it's an open action it might be you know everybody who's an AMP financial planner at this stage um, is automatically included awesome and then what's let, let's say let's fast forward a handful of years let's say that the AMP class action is successful what is the result of that? Is, is the result simply um, that the new terms are not introduced mm -hmm. or is the result you get a monetary yeah. um, reimbursement with your losses? What, what, what's sort of the result of a class action? So depending on the action that's taken, but, but let's say the first thing would be uh, if it's successful, that would find that AMP wasn't allowed to make the changes as they did. And therefore, you're back to where it was before the changes occurred. Um, this, so that then gives people another 13 months notice to work out what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, the, the, whatever changes occurred subsequent to that would be disallowed. And the third thing is that basically because the changes haven't occurred, you're now eligible for four times recurring revenue again. Okay. So there would be a damages claim for the amount of money that uh, the difference between four times and two and a half or 1.42 you know, for the grandfathered commissions. So the way that would work normally, and you know, I'm not a lawyer, is that they would calculate what the damage is and then typically the court would order AMP to pay it normally to the lawyer's trust account, I think, and then it'd be dispersed. That is really interesting. I have never actually gone through and learnt how a class action works. And that is, that's some really good intel, man. Like hopefully that there's AMP planners out there that are listening to this and sort of have a bit more of an idea because yeah, that it's all very much news to me. Um, with AMP sort of coming out and saying, um, you know, that the future of advice is technology that really goes, uh, against, I guess, X, Y advisors view. We're extremely bullish on human advisors. Um, we've got a platform, you know, that we're launching. Um, hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, it's already out. Um, but replicating sort of conversations that are going on currently, we're using it on Facebook um, so uh, we tend to think that with complexities of the individual, uh, you know, client position that having a human help someone navigate those requires human interaction. And for AMP to sort of come out and say that the future is, uh, robo and tech um, where do you think consumers sit with that in mind? So they're kind of looking at AMP as this old school company that got dragged through the Royal Commission and they have had, you know, an unfortunate time with their planners, um, which they're currently in court with. I mean, I, I feel like that decision is going to really backfire with a company that none of us want to see go under. Like anyone in financial services would be kind of devastated to see such an old established cornerstone of our whole industry go under. And I don't think anyone wants to see that, but it's kind of looking like there's, writing on the wall a little bit, unfortunately, <laughs> because I go, well, what's, what, what stakeholder of the whole industry, whether it's planner or consumer is now going to feel like they can connect with this company. If their entire traditional business model has been um, replaced. And so does that kind of language 
get used when you know the the financial planning association is dealing with um the amp itself i mean is that sort of is that does that get communicated because i feel like there's some something's missing somewhere like someone's missing the point if they think that technology is going to solve all the problems i've got a financial planner i've I'm more than capable of figuring out my products, but the reason I use a financial planner is is somebody independent giving me advice and my wife advice on what's actually happening. And secondly, it's to make it easy for me to to take it. You know, I remember years ago walking around with an application in my briefcase uh, back in the day, and it took a year to fill it in. Now, with a financial advisor, it gets filled in pretty quickly. Yeah. And the third thing is if something happens to me, they're around to sort out, you know, the mess afterwards. Um, from a practical perspective, what we think will occur is that technology will actually help the advisor do the admin stuff yeah. so that they can focus more on the face-to-face engagement with their client, the trade-off conversations that they occur. You know, we've all you know, hear the stories of, you know, why have you got that? And, you know, the husband and wife have never, never talked about that. You know, one of my advisors talked about the guy having a plane and, you know, said, well, you know, it costs you a lot of money to run the plane. And his wife says, yeah, I know. (laughs) And they never actually talked about this, you know, elephant in the room of this plane that the guy had. And um, when he had the conversation, they they worked through it. And the the client still got the plane, apparently. But (laughs) it it became a much better understanding of why it was there and what it cost and what what the value added, you know. Um, now, I can't see a computer being able to do that in a, in a sensible way. Um, but what a computer can do is compare products quickly, produce a statement of advice quickly. Um, all of the, the lower value stuff can be automated so that you can actually have a deep conversation with the client. Yeah. And that's really, to me, what a financial planner does rather than a financial advisor. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, I've never really solved that question in my mind as to what is the difference between a planner and an advisor. But yeah, that that sounds as, as good as uh, as any that I've heard. Oh, thank you. It's good to see um, financial products completely getting out of um, advice. You know, like you've got all the big end of town, and now it's even AMP who seem to be getting out of advice. Um, I was just, I caught up with uh, Centerpoint this morning uh, with their team. They got to, you know, because of the whole uh, PIS issue a decade ago and they sort of almost were the the patient zero um, of, you know, uh, going through the, your, your whole compliance and and they've come out really well prepared, at least from my point of view, to sort of, start making calls and decisions and almost leading the industry um, moving forward. But I, you know, like there's with all this that's going on um, and I really hope like my, the whole reason X, Y exists is support advisors, right. And to, to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. And so we're, we're all good and we're all okay. And all positive about changes need to occur, but, Something you've mentioned is, you know, like giving it time and making it reasonable. And that is exactly our point of view. So from, so from a personal point of view, like I want all of these financial planners and looked after. And so, you know, I really hope that, um, that, you know, the advisors aren't the ones to lose out here. And I bloody will very much support the success and hopeful, you know, good outcomes for planners if, if the class action does go exist. Um, but at the same time, like I'm sort of excited to yeah. see that through all this, you know, maelstrom of bad stuff that's happening, that it's looking like we're, we're pulling apart financial planning and product. And at a really high level, I think once we get through this, that advice is going to improve um, what, what it means to be an advisor will have a much clearer 
idea and um and i'm super excited and i just want to see advisors not get screwed over in this transition that's kind of my whole world view at the moment well one of the things that's important to get across you know the planners that have been asked to leave are actually in the vast majority of cases good planners they just don't fit in mp's future business model i mean you know we've got Typically, it seems to be somebody who's doing less than half a million dollars of turnover. And, you know, you can be a fairly good practice turning over 250, 300 grand with one support staff, yeah. looking after your clients. You know, it, it may not be economic for a &P, but, you know, it's still an economic business. And, you know, we've seen that. We've had more than half a dozen licensees approach us and saying, look, if you've got planners who are looking for a home, give us a call um, or get them to give them a call. Um, and, and so these are good planners generally, but they'll be looking for new homes. Um, and the clients love them, as you know. I mean, the, the research shows that if you've got a planner, you're better off and you feel comfortable and you trust them. Um, we choose between people who never had a planning experience and people who have. Um, thanks so much for coming on uh, and sharing with us today. I know you're probably one of the most busy people in the industry right now. So, yeah, really appreciate your, your insights. I'm sure a lot of uh, advisors, both AMP and external, will find this really valuable information. Um, normally, I say, how, how do people reach out to you? But I feel like you're probably swamped with communications as it is. So, um, I'm sure the people that need to know we'll know the correct channels to, to catch you on. So, uh, mate, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, look, and, and if anybody wants me, I'm pretty visible in LinkedIn and other things anyway. So, more than happy to, uh, I'm a great believer you have to put something back into the community as well as just take something out of it. So, yep. thanks for your time, Clayton. And Thank you, mate. Speak soon. Later.